Okay, we've talked about uh, New Deal Part 1. Um, because of the severity of the Depression, the period after that, about 1934 to 35, was a period of intense political and social unrest. Uh, the NRA was dismantled, but it set in force political forces which could not be stopped. Uh, expectation for change and belief that it could be done by the government grew. Some people were disturbed by the conservative, in their view, nature of the, uh, the New Deal. They felt that ordinary people were being ignored while big business was being propped up. In the South and Midwest, million, and, and so what results is a number of populist demagogues. Uh, let's review what that means. It's a leader who seeks support by pre preying on people's prejudices, particularly their negative ones. Uh, sometimes they're racist ones. In ancient Greece and Rome, this was a leader who espoused the cause for the common people. So it wasn't always a, a pejorative, but it is now. In many ways, Julius Caesar was one of the first demagogues. And the biggest one was Senator Huey Long of Louisiana. In the South and the Midwest, millions listened regularly to the radio addresses uh, he made. He claimed that, quote, not a single thin dime of concentrated, bloated, pompous wealth Massed in the hands of a few people has been raked down to relieve the masses. That was his sort of uh, uh, oratory. He proposed a redistribution of wealth, not unlike uh, a Zapata solution, uh, that would guarantee each family an estate of $5,000. Uh, last year I converted that number just out of curiosity. That's $81,000 in 2010 dollars. He proposed this be, you know, tax from the rich, and, and literally give an estate uh, to everybody. He inspired hundreds of thousands of people to join his Share the Wealth clubs. A majority came from the middle class, professionals, small farmers, small businessmen, who worried that the big business orientation of the New Deal would undermine their economic and social status. And it was also, they were also joined by highly skilled and clerical um, white-collar workers who, who aspired to middle class status. By 1935, FDR considered Long his greatest rivalry, greatest rival for the presidency. Uh, but spoiler alert, he was assassinated before the election. Meanwhile, uh, in the Midwest, Father Charles Coughlin, who was known as the Radio Priest, uh, delivered a similar message. He had a weekly radio audience in 1933 and 34 of 30 to 40 million, it's a huge audience in that time. Like Long, he appealed to anxious middle class Americans. He was an ardent FDR supporter at first. He said, the New Deal is Christ's deal. Later, he became a harsh critic. Uh, he said the New Deal was run by bankers, and the NRA was designed to help business. He called for a strong government to force capital, labor, and all other interests to do its bidding for the general good. Now, that, 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 that phrase I just said, at its essence, he didn't call it this, is fascism. So ask me about fascism in class. Um, he founded the, the National Union uh, of Social Justice uh, in 1934 as a precursor to what he hoped would be a political party that would challenge the Democrats in 1936. Coughlin admired leaders like Benito Mussolini, who built strong states through decree rather than democracy. And his, his Coughlin's frustration with the New Deal heightened, so did his admiration for Mussolini and Hitler, who appeared to be working miracles uh, in Europe. Uh, he often spoke of Jewish bankers and a world conspiracy to dispossess the trolling, toiling masses of their wealth. Uh, you begin to see how anti-Semitism uh, comes into this uh, demagoguery, uh, obviously with horrible results in Germany. Um, has his frustration with the New Deal heightened, so did his admiration uh, for these other people, and so did his anti-Semitism, so much so that many radio stations began uh, dropping his show. Uh, there were other self-styled reformers, Light, Long, and Coughlin, but none transformed their popularity into broad political power. Still, uh, the attack on the New Deal deepened popular discontent and helped legitimize other insurgent movements, uh, the most important of which was the labor movement. Now, you might think that labor had a tough time in, in the, uh, the Great Depression. After all, um, it was not in high demand, uh, and that was sort of would logically weaken their power, but the, con the, the opposite is true. Uh, people were pissed off, and they translated that into, into pow uh, political power for unions. Labor was diverse. Of course, it included radicals, conservatives, northerners, southerners, blacks, whites, unskilled, factory workers, farm workers, women. 
But even so, it was less diverse than it had been in the Progressive Era. You'll recall that in the Gilded Age, one of labor's weakness was how, how diverse it was. But it was much less so than it had been. Mass migration had effectively ended, except for the, uh, the Dust Bowl. Um, and Americanization through schools and popular culture had forged a more common identity. The Great Depression furthered that sense of unity. Surviving a trial together uh, heightens a sense of unity, as it did with the Mexicans in the Mexican Revolution. This commonality of working class sentiment first became apparent in 1932 when almost all of labor voted for FDR. The NRA uh, helped transform despair into hope by setting its guidelines for wages and working hours. Part of the NRA actually guaranteed the right of labor to unionize. Millions of laborers, because the, the idea being labor would help um, keep wages high, uh, fight the deflationary death spiral. Um, uh, many, millions of laborers joined unions in 33 and 34. They were encouraged by John L. Lewis, who was the president of the United Mine Workers, but uh, also worked to unionize all parts of, of uh, the industry. He said, quote, the president wants you to join a union. Actually, he didn't. FDR had never said that. He opposed the rapid growth of unions, but Lewis hoped to transform a working class support for FDR into union streaks. So he sort of aligned himself with FDR. Um, many employers, uh, well, and, and um, they made modest demands at first, just to adhere to the NRA guidelines. That's what labor wanted. But many employers resisted these guidelines, uh, however, and uh, certainly opposed workers having any say over working conditions. And so workers flooded Washington with letters asking FDR and uh, General Hugh Johnson to force employers to comply. When the workers' pleas went unanswered, workers began taking action. 1934, they staged 2,000 strikes a few of which escalated into armed confrontations not seen since the 19th century. In T uh, Toledo, Ohio, in May uh, 34, 10,000 workers surrounded the electric auto light plant demanding a shutdown during which a union contract could be negotiated. A seven-hour battle between strikers and police failed to dislodge them. The National Guard was called in, and two strikers were killed uh, in a gunfire exchange. A similar situation occurred in Minneapolis. It was unionized truck drivers and warehouse workers. It left four dead, hundreds wounded. Employers had hoped to use force to break the two-month-old strike. Instead, more than 100,000 additional transportation workers went on a sympathy strike in support. From July 4th, I'm sorry, 5th to 19th, San Francisco was virtually shut down. Now, the largest and most violent confrontation began in September when 400,000 textile workers went on strike from mills, uh, textile mills that stretched from Maine to Alabama. Uh, cloth production was shut down for the first two weeks of September. Employers hired strike breakers and private security to replace them, resulting in violent clashes. In the South especially, vigilantes would support the police and National Guard in beating up strikers, killing union organizers and incarcerating hundreds of strikers in barbed wire camps. Uh, concentration camps, so to speak. Uh, 